Yeah, well, I was asked to talk about something we sort of touched on, if you're here this morning. And, um, for those of you at the BQR meeting in the last two days, we've also talked about it there. Is making evidence accessible. We had a very technical meeting this morning about what constitutes evidence and what we include and exclude in the evidence base. But the, the question is, how can we make it accessible and relevant? So let's just rehearse one of two things that I guess we probably know, but what is evidence-based policy? To me, it's pretty straightforward. It's about helping people make better decisions <coughs> and to achieve better outcomes. That's absolutely crucial, I think, to the whole evidence-based policy movement is to make better outcomes and achieve better things by using the best available evidence. And notice I've italicized the best available evidence. It may not always be the best evidence. And we had a very interesting discussion earlier, which was quite technical. And we are trying to make that evidence better and better. And we do want really highest quality evidence. But we're beginning to acknowledge at 3IE that we sometimes have to work with lower quality evidence, medium quality evidence and low quality evidence, and to acknowledge that and to signify, indicate to decision makers where there are weaknesses and biases. Many people talk about the what works initiative. What works, they equate evidence-based policy with what works. And it, that is an underlying desire of evidence-based policy and practice, is to establish what works. But I think most of us are going beyond that to say, to do what? To achieve what outcomes? And it's, again, it always come back to outcomes. Uh, because that's the long-term objective. And to do that, of course, we have to work quite a way along what we call the causal chain, more about that in a minute. And also for which groups of people, and this is the uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneity or diversity or variance point, is that we don't always know if we're actually achieving outcomes for all of the people, we should be, and particularly for the hard to reach. And I think a common denominator in our room is we're concerned with poverty and problems associated with poverty, education, health, access to water, sanitation, agriculture, food security. And it concerns us that we, we, we often can gain evidence about the average impact we have. But do we have the impact not just on the poor, but the very poor and the extreme poor, and also the unknown poor, which is going to be very hard to impact if we don't know who they are. And that's not just a South African problem. That's so in every country developing and developed. In the UK, we have exactly the same problem, is that we've done an awful lot over the last 50 years to increase a lot of poor, poor people. But there are people who are really hard to reach. So we need to make sure that we, we, we are doing what works to achieve the, what outcomes for all groups of people. And then under what conditions? Uh, this is very important from a policy point of view, which is to say many things work under the conditions we test them in. We talked this morning about, um, about uh, t uh, t t t test conditions, uh, and they're, they're what we tend to call efficacy studies. <coughs> studies that work under test conditions don't necessarily work when we roll them out to the real world, and that's what we have to do. So we've got to identify what are the features, the factors, the variables that make things work in different contexts and for different people. And over what time span. Uh, we have to face the fact that a lot of the things we're dealing with are medium to long term to very long term. You don't eradicate poverty, notwithstanding what we've claimed from the Millennium Development Goals or even halved it or quartered it. There is still a lot, a lot of poverty about and there will be for a long time. Um, but the, the, uh, a, a long-term uh, objective like poverty will be many years or decades, but there are things that we also do that we can measure and be fairly confident about on an annual two-year, three-year, four-year basis. And we've got to think that's often the time span we're working in. But some of that will be even longer. For those of us who are interested in reducing poverty, we're probably interested in reducing intergenerational poverty. So programs that have been instigated since 1994, a very significant period in South Africa's history, some of those we'd like to see come into fruition now because those kids, the babies who were born in 1994, are 21, they're adults. They'll soon be having their own families if they haven't already done so. 
We have an identical situation in the UK. We had a massive program called the Sure Start program, and that was basically a program to help children in the ages zero through four by giving them access to nutrition, to education, to parental support, and what have you. And our long term outcome of that program will be in about 2021 when those children are become adults. But of course, along the way, we've had plenty of transitional points. Are we making progress when they go to school, to reception, to school, to primary school, to secondary school, to maturity, and so forth? So along the way, we need to make sure that we're measuring realistically uh, the outcomes. And sorry to harp on about this, but at what costs? <clears throat> The programs that we are interested in, the policies, the interventions, the projects, uh, come at a cost. And we don't, frankly, have enough evidence at the moment about the cost of programs. Uh, many things work in social policy, in health policy, education, agriculture, development, sanitation. But they're at a cost that is just not accessible under current or even uh, short-term or medium-term perspectives. And we at 3RE are leading a movement to get people, when they do evaluations, to also build in cost estimations, and to do it with an, a, an economist, a social welfare or a health or an education economist, who knows how to measure that. It's an absolutely essential item, and it's one thing we need to flag up. This is about making it relevant. Now, I worked in Treasury, in the, in, in the British Treasury for a year, and it's the I wouldn't say it's the only question they wanted, but it was the number one question. So I could show evidence that this worked, this had this effect, and this had diversity effects, and the bottom line was, Phil, how much is it? And do the benefits that you're telling us exceed the costs by a margin of at least 2.5%? Uh, because less than that, the minimal detectable effect is hardly worth investing in from a Treasury point of view. And that's a, a reality we have to face is that Treasury has to pay for these things, or the taxpayer has to pay for these things. So 3 i is leading a bit of a movement to get more cost data, and when we do systematic reviews, to try and review what data there are on costs and benefits. But it ain't just about evidence, and people have heard me talk about this before, and I don't mind repeating it. It is integrating evidence, research evidence, evaluation evidence, review evidence, with the people who are responsible for our programs. They're the decision makers' knowledge, their skills, their experience, expertise, and this vital world judgment. Because evidence comes to life when people make judgments based upon it. And you, there is no direct one relationship, one to one relationship between high quality evidence and making a difference. We had a discussion this morning, somebody asked, uh, very sensibly this morning, how do you know when you've got enough? Well, that is a classic judgment call, and I want to look a little bit at that uh, in a moment. So, here's the famous petal diagram. Once again, it gets weird out because I want people to remember it. Evidence, for me, will be at the heart of decision-making. That's, the, uh, I think, it's the ambition of all of us who work in evidence-based policy and practice. But don't let's kid ourselves. What drives policy, what drives interventions, will be people's values, beliefs, and ideology. And there's no better country in the world I can think of to mention that than South Africa, that went through a very long, hard, bloody struggle to establish a society, a nation, based on a different set of values, a different set of beliefs, and a very different ideology to those of separatism and apartheid. And is driven by that, and will go on being driven by that. Uh, it'll adapt, it'll have to adapt, but there's certain core values that a country like South Africa will always have at the heart of its policy making. And when I have academics come up to me and say, oh, it's so disappointing people in South Africa don't do everything according to the randomized controlled trial, well, there are other factors that are driving this evidence, uh, that are driving the change, not just evidence. So let me go back to the people, some are in this room, people who are actually running things, people who are making decisions in government, people in NGOs who are implementing. Their experience and expertise is vital to honour it and to respect it and to integrate it into what we do with evidence, to make sense of it. Uh, those who have heard me this week too often, too much I think, know that I keep stressing evidence doesn't tell you what to do. 
you make sense of evidence and decide how to use it depending on your values and beliefs and ideology, your experience and your expertise. I was truly impressed when I moved from academia to work in the British Cabinet Office and then Treasury at how people had insight into things that we didn't have insight into in academia because they'd just been working in public service for 20, 30 years. It's what, a lot of it they could never explicate. I, I used to say to people, where, did, where does this come from? And there's a very lovely piece, long, very old piece now, by Michael Polliani, who's a, a political uh, scientist, who wrote about tacit knowledge, that people have a tacit knowledge within them that really helps, helps us make decisions about when to do something, how to do it, when it's appropriate, when it's relevant. So I, I really want to draw upon this. This is my little intersection points here. Ignore that, and we ignore that at our peril. There is expertise other than what we do from evidence. And that leads on to people's judgment. People must judge whether our evidence is appropriate and relevant, whether it's the type of evidence they want. Uh, they need to judge uh, w whether, in fact, we can afford it, which takes us to the resources issue. And in addition to cash, money, tax, money, mm. I'm talking about human resources as well. We need, if you do a theories of change analysis to see how to get policies into practice, you find that often you need, in addition to cash, you need social capital, you need intellectual capital, you need cultural capital. Again, I repeat, in South Africa, such a lovely diverse society, that's going to be very variable. And we need to tap into that in order to make sense of evidence and get it meaningful and relevant. Those of you who have been working in evidence-based policy will know that one of the fierce resistance to it is just the way we always do things. Okay? We encounter bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is about doing what we've always done. And I've had lunches and teas and various meals with people over the last few days who said, Phil, you don't know what it's like in my department. I keep hitting a brick wall uh, for all sorts of reasons. And these are not personal ad hominem. These are structural bureaucratic reasons in the way we the way we organize our work the way we keep falling back onto the great old days of the struggle and it's always going to be there and it needs to be celebrated but you know we've got to move on as well we've got to find new ways of working new ways of thinking and new ways of, of being habitual and i want the habit to be how about engaging with evidence as one of the things we do almost habitually when we make policy we don't just make it on the on our beliefs we, we engage with evidence and do let's remember there are very many other people other than academics and evaluators and researchers influencing policy. And also, can I say, doing it a lot better than we do. Lobbyists and presser groups are there to do that. And they know how to do it. I was saying at lunch to some colleagues that uh, when I used to bring my academic colleagues into government, uh, I don't know, it's like in South Africa, you're lucky if you can get a 10 minute with a minister. And I managed to get a double 10 minute, they had 20 minutes and they completely blew it. They had no idea how to present a convincing argument or case in a non-academic way. And I just saw the minister fade and basically we said, thank you, 10 minutes is up, they left. Okay? A lobbyist wouldn't do that. A lobbyist would bite the hand of 10 minutes uh, and use it effectively. And whilst I'm never promoting lobbyists, I would love us to use some of the techniques that lobbyists do, the communication techniques, the networking techniques. A AEN can become a bit of a lobby group, is a lobby group, is a pressure group for evidence. Uh, so we really need to remember that. One other point about lobbies and pressure groups, they're, they're somebody we've really got to work with or get around because a good lobbyist, a good pressure group, is always going to present a selective argument, an argument based on selective evidence. And we've got to give them the totality of evidence, the balance of evidence, a more rounded view. That's what I think we're in the business of doing. And the last petal is now the flower. Isn't that cute? Somebody said this was a flower full of nice petals. I've got a colour version that's even better. Is if you work in government, if you work in an NGO, if you work in anything, stuff happens, okay? There are pragmatic things that happen, like... Uh, uh, growth rates don't come in at the rate we thought. Inflation's higher than we thought. We need to raise the interest rates on the economic front. But other things like we have floods. 
We have droughts. We have, I know, I know if you still have, uh, is here last year, electricity shortages, particularly in this part of uh, South Africa. Uh, lights kept, the last time I was here, the lights kept going off. And that, that's the reality of life. And we've got to remember that because governments have to deal with those pragmatic, life-changing circumstances where you're dealing with different levels of government, different spirits of government and what have you. So, and just contingencies like earthquakes, floods, fire, can destroy many of the best laid plans based on evidence. Uh, I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded as I go around the world how the events in New York on 9-11, 2001, have transformed policy, policy in as much as people are now spending around the world much more money on security, anti-terrorism, and what have you, and the international crises that we have, which means it's not going into poverty reduction necessarily, or certainly not education, health. So there's been a reallocation of resources just based on, uh, I call them contingencies. So, the appeal of this slide is that let's think of these touch points here where these can engage with evidence, but evidence can engage with those elements. I firmly believe if we can link those up, we're going to be successful in making evidence relevant, getting it heard, not necessarily used, but let's hopefully used. And I think it'll just make our evidence a lot more sophisticated than some of the uh, rather technical arguments we often have about effect sizes and distributions, which, my goodness, we sorely need. Now, there are many copies of the, uh, many versions of the policy cycle. This is the one I find in many textbooks. This is an idealised world where we start off, we think about a problem, the conceptualisation. Sorry, we're starting up here. So we talk about the conceptualisation phase, often very short, by the way. I often think a bit more time spent at the conceptualisation stage may yield benefits later. We then move into the policy development stage where we're thinking about solutions. We then move into the implementation stage where we roll things out and try and put them into effect. And then people tell me we do monitoring and evaluation. Okay, the last stage. I couldn't disagree more. Monitoring and evaluation starts here. Right at the beginning, this is where you begin evaluation, monitoring, evidence, getting, getting, giving, very early on. And the mistake is that we do this, sometimes we do this three years after we've rolled a program out. A uh, young lady came to me after the last session and said, Phil, what do you do when you haven't got any baseline data from three years ago? <laughs> I said, you don't do, is what you don't do. You know, what do you do when people come along and say, Phil, would your group like to evaluate a program we started three years ago, but we don't have any data about where we started from? Now, you can reconstitute respect, retrospectively uh, baseline data, but it's, it's not a good way to do it. And you're then missing all the contextual specificity, the political context, and what have you. We have another model in, uh, in the UK which sometimes travels to other countries. Oddly how colonialism never dies. As a country, um, they use the British Treasury model, which is called the ROMEF model, for no other reason. It's an acronym for rational, objectives, appraisal, monitoring, and evaluation. And the inner circle is the circle we use for doing impact assessments. Now, impact assessments are different from impact evaluation. Impact assessments are structured ways in which we ex ante, or a priori, at the beginning, um, assess what is the likely outcome of the policy that's being proposed. Most countries, uh, most countries around the world are using them. They may use them selectively. You may do, let's do a health impact assessment, or an environmental impact assessment, or a social impact assessment. In the UK, you have to do all three, plus an economic impact assessment. Before you can get ministerial sign-off, you have to do a structured way of summoning and gathering evidence to make sure at the outset of a policy, before it goes for legislation or before it goes for funding, you have to make the convincing case. And that's called an impact assessment. And that's the inner circle. But it's interesting, in both of them, they're putting evaluation and evidence gathering at the end. Now, impact assessments don't, because I've been working on them for some time. We're bringing evidence in at the very beginning. That is the point. The earlier you can think about evidence, it is a, evidence has to be used across the entire policy cycle. And I think that's something we can help shift 
Don't come to us for evidence too late. Come at the right and appropriate time. So what kind of evidence do policymakers look for? A lot. If you were here, you saw it in a slightly different form earlier today. First of all, we're often, and, and, and uh, Taryn mentioned this also this morning, when we look at a health problem, well, how, what is the problem? How big is it? What's driving it? What is the nature of the problem? Well, it's no different from any other problem in education, agriculture, poverty. We need to get on top of the size of the problem, sorry, the nature of the problem, the size and its dynamics. Second, we need to specify, or policymakers need to specify, very early on, what are they trying to do? What are their desired objectives? What are the outcomes? And to put them in a timed manner. What are interim, sorry, what are initial, what are interim, and what are long term? Policymakers have to make decisions on policy options. In the impact assessments in the UK, you are required before you before you get ministerial sign-off to show you've considered at least one policy option to the one that the government's offering and the option of doing nothing other than what the business is usual, doing nothing. Now that's the same, my friends, as doing a counterfactual analysis. It's saying your policy options is counterfactual analysis. It's, OK, we're going to try and get more kids out of school with higher, edu higher qualifications. We can do it with textbooks, but maybe we can do it with some other way. Maybe we can do it by learning opportunities. Maybe we can do it by, I don't know, we can do it by incentives to parents. Okay? But, but that's the decisions that policymakers have to make. They have to have options, and we're trying to make those as evidence-based as possible. So you're starting on the, strong, on the strong foot. You're starting in the position where what we're going to do is grounded in the best available evidence. And that's what I spent a lot of my time doing in government. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Then they want to know, just as we as analysts want to know, how is the policy supposed to work? They need to know, how, what are the mechanisms by, this, by which this is going to work? Uh, who's going to do this policy? Who's going to be the rollout agent? Who are the people who are most appropriate and also most effective to do this? So this is where we transition very nicely to a theory of change approach. In addition to having generalised objectives, what are the likely outcomes and what are the achieved outcomes? Um, this is something where our impact assessments are very good. We have to say, before ministerial sign-off, we estimate that we're going to get a X percent improvement if we do A rather than if we do B. And X has to be of a, a number that is sustainable, uh, can, be, can, be, can be warranted, and we also, this is where the, I do agree having a post hoc follow up, we do an annual two, uh, two yearly and three yearly evaluation of are we anywhere near our ex ante guesstimations? Are we anywhere near it? And that means going to embodying and embedding monitoring and evaluation into the policy rollout. I talked about who do we affect, which groups, so we need to know a lot about the social distribution of outcomes, the social distribution of impacts. Um, and I'm almost always interested in the tail of the curve as much as the central tendency. And what impact are we having, not just statistically, numerically, in terms of dollars and cents, rands and cents, pounds and whatever we were having Britain pennies, we also want to get subjective ideas. We need to know whether we're influencing people in their attitudes, their experiences, and their behaviours. Now, South Africa and Britain share a very important uh, survey called the South African Social Attitude Survey. Uh, we call it the British Social Attitude Survey that our colleague Michael Noble, who can I pay respect to, has done an awful lot to push on evidence in South Africa as well as Britain. And that's one vehicle we can do it with. Uh, the, the South African Social Attitude Survey is a structured way in which routinely the people of South Africa are surveyed wholly about these subjective attitudes, their experiences, and we hope some data on behaviour. But there are many other sources. You don't have to have a large survey like that. We need to think when we're evaluating small projects or programmes or localised projects, how are we affecting people's lives from their point of view? For this, we need much more survey and qualitative evidence. I've 
won't say it again about costs and benefits, but they're essential. That's what policymakers want to know. Your treasury want to know it, number one. How much is it going to cost? And lastly, but not least, do we know what are effective and ineffective ways of delivery? I was saying yesterday, I think somewhere I said this week, in, in Whitehall, we have a phrase that there are no bad policies, there is only bad implementation. I also believe there are some very bad policies, believe me. <laughs> but I do take the point that often a very good, well-proven policy doesn't work because it just isn't implemented appropriately with the right people, with the right agencies, with the right resources at the right time. So there's a lot of things that decision makers want to know. I was constantly being asked for this stuff when I worked in government. Any of you working for a research capacity in government are probably the same. Not necessarily on the same day at the same time, but in the body of work that you do as an analyst in government, that's what they want to know. And I've transferred that into this little table about the types of evidence we want. Um, surveys, you know, taking all those issues, we need surveys, qualitative studies, theories of change analysis, systematic reviews of research synthesis, New kid on the block, we need evidence gap maps. The discussion this morning was about experimental, quasi-experimental designs. We need that information. Again, for people's attitudes, experiences, we need a combination of surveys and qualitative. And how to make a policy work, how to do good implementation and delivery, we need really all of the above. And perhaps also, uh, statistically, focus, focusing much more from regression studies on things like mediating variables and moderating variables. So everybody's got something to bring to the party, which I think is the classic case for saying evidence-based policy has to be mixed methods-based policy. I think everyone in the room knows about theory of change, so am I right? Anybody not? It simply asks a set of questions. It's the how the policy works, what activities, mechanisms, people and outputs have to be in place. And I think a good theory of change tries to develop a sequential causal model. Now I acknowledge we often, if not always, oversimplify this. Because we like to think that if we can get A right, that'll lead to B, which will lead to C, will lead to D, to E, and E will be the outcomes. We all know that, in fact, the causal chain is very much iterative. It skips phases, A goes to C, C goes back to B, it's all over the place. But let's keep with a simplistic model to start with, having still recognised that the cause, causal chain is often very complex. Resources I've already mentioned. What data are required? Now, people think data is only important for analysts, and it's crucial for analysts. We can't do evaluations without data. I think it's important for policymakers and people who are making decisions. Okay? If they don't have the data about the costs, about the effect sizes, but they want effect sizes in a way that means something to them, in a language they understand. So yesterday, we looked at a study where somebody wrote, as a, in a policy brief, the effect size would be 0.12 standard deviations over the counterfactual. I haven't a clue what that means. I haven't a clue in the context. I want that, trans if I was a policymaker, I want that transformed into a metric that people would use. This will mean that 2,000 additional children will gain a matriculation certificate or will be able to read at age six or age seven. The 0.12 of the standard deviation is a technical term that doesn't resonate with people who have to make decisions. So don't let's use it. And by the way, that's from a, a 3 IE publication. And the young man has already been well and truly reprimanded overnight to go change it quickly. We do not want that on our website, people talking that language. When we're talking about policy briefs, I mean, if you want to talk about it as the back office stuff, I have no problems. And I think what we need in a theory of change when we're policy makers, practitioners, or doers, Sometimes we need to make the decision, don't go. This policy is not ready, this program's not ready to be rolled out. Now that's usually above our pay grade. This is often getting to the senior senior, the DG level, and of course our ministers, and I appreciate how difficult it is. I personally have had one or two experiences where we've held up a policy, if only for a few weeks or months, 
because all the pieces are simply not in place. We don't know which is the appropriate implementation agency. We don't have the money. The budget that's been voted is nowhere near what is needed. So don't roll out something that is not going to demonstrably work. It's a hard, it's a hard argument to sell, but it's one that we need to be aware of. Do we proceed unless we have all the ingredients necessary to produce the outcomes? So I simply put this in a, a sequential model. Uh, I'm not going to spend much more time in it now. But this is often seen as something that we analysts do. I, if I've had any marginal success in my life and career, I got several servants to start using this model in their work to say, let's make sure we've got all the troops lined up in order to produce our outputs that will produce our outcomes that will have the impacts we want. So a theory of change isn't an academic thing. It isn't just an analyst thing. It is essentially a way any decision maker should work. And underlying every theory of change is this point, what assumptions are we making? Policies often go wrong because people believe an agency A exists, B knows what it's doing, and three has the resources to do it. And then they find in actual fact that agency is well past its sell by date. It hasn't got the right staff, it doesn't have the resources, so the program fails. What mechanism do we use? We often use market mechanisms when a regulatory mechanism would be much better. It might be better to have a state agency do it rather than the private sector or vice versa. It might be something that we're putting through a state agency that's ineffective, could be done much better by a private sector agency. And that leads to this one here. So it's just thinking all these points through to identify what needs to be in place for a policy to be successful. And what I've done here is added in the sorts of evidence we need for, I've now turned it vertically. What do we need at each of those levels? This is what we're going to do, this is what it means, but the evidence we need is varied. Just at the input stage, we need to know about, we need to use evidence from surveys, from statistics, demographic data, we need qualitative data, cost-benefit data, systematic view data, and documentary data. <coughs> when we get into the activities, this is a, what is going to be done. Who's going to be the doing? Well, we need to know performance data. What is the performance like of the existing people doing it? Could, is, it, is, it is it behind the curve or in front of the curve? We need historical data, historical trend data. We need to say, you know, diversity data. At the moment, in what we do, who, who actually benefits from what we do and who does and so forth. Each one of these has got a call out. I'm not going to go through them all. I've thought them through. That they're the sorts of data. Somewhere up here we need the counterfactual data, if you were here this morning, that we were talking about. In fact, I often want to see it brought in about here. What do we know at the outset about uh, policy A versus policy B? I think the point of this slide is evidence-based policy is very data-hungry. But it's, all, it's not infinitely data hungry. It's organized around, around, organized around surveys, administrative data, performance data, effectiveness data, counterfactual data. And that's what we can offer specialist uh, advice and evidence in those dimensions. So I think we've come to the conclusion, I know I'm on home ground here that probably the soundest basis for evidence-based evidence policy is some form of systematic review or research synthesis. And we have statistical meta-analysis. If you're here this morning, we had a bit of a rehearsal of that. We need narrative systematic reviews. So statistical meta-analysis, remember, is where we combine together the evidence, the statistical evidence, from studies on similar uh, interventions, uh, populations, outcomes, and uh, whatever, and we combine it into a cumulative sample. Uh, and as Taryn and I said this morning, often we can't do statistical meta-analysis, it's not appropriate. So we do narrative systematic reviews, and I like a good systematic review to have both narrative and statistical components. Because, and Tara said this morning, and I agree with her, sometimes you don't get the statistical bit. The data's not appropriate. 
The interventions aren't appropriate, the populations aren't appropriate. But we can certainly describe and extract key information in a narrative form from the evidence that we do have. And that's what those of us in the review movements are doing. We can, we do, and we must do the review and synthesis of qualitative uh, interventions, uh, qualitative evidence, uh, often seen as the poor cousin. I can't think why, because if you're trying to look at some of the questions that require qualitative evidence, it's, it's the, rich, the rich cousin. It's the one you most need. It's, if you're trying to look at people's attitudes, uh, and they are often the significant intervening variables between an input and an output. So we know we can get an effect size, but if you've got people's attitudes, their beliefs, their experiences, they're going to be a buffer between getting a policy working and not. So we need to find out from quality reviews what they're like. We've talked about rapid evidence assessments as a way of doing systematic reviews a lot quicker. And if you're not familiar too much with systematic reviews, I've never really seen a de decent systematic review done in le less than a year. At 3IE, we're running at 18 months to two years for a systematic review, which is disgraceful, but it's, that's the way it has to be because they're very hard to do. So they're not the immediate tool for people in decision-making. If there's one that's already gathered, then we take them to it and say, use an existing systematic review. But if you have no evidence, you might want to do a review quickly. And that's what a rapid evidence assessment is. And we also, if we have nothing else to offer our policy and practitioner colleagues, is we can at least map the evidence. Show them where we've got evidence, and more importantly, often, where we, where we have not. Okay, I'm going to skip this because I've mentioned it at least ten times today. <laughs> I do want to remind us, though, what do we mean by a, why is a systematic review systematic? Okay, this is very important. It's simply the thoroughness with which we do it. The searching for studies has to be comprehensive, global, and done rigorously and systematically. That's one of the reasons they take a long time. And because the flow of evidence is constant, you're always chasing your tail. You've just done a search, you need to do a quick follow-up search, and often you find there's another 20 studies being published. In some areas in healthcare, we find there's even more than that. Education, by the way, is catching up very fast. We're finding the number of good quality studies are really chasing. So systematic searching, then separating out the high from the low, from the medium quality evidence. To separate the wheat from the chaff, we call this critical appraisal. It's done against a set of critical appraisal standards, and we need those, and we have them, and they've got to be transparent. So transparency about why we include some studies and why we exclude others is crucial. And I say that because even now, 30 years since Cochrane, sorry, 25 years since Cochrane started, 15 since Campbell, people are still not saying why or how they've excluded some review from a study and why they've included others. You absolutely need to do that. We need to be systematic in the way we are transparent in how we extract data from our included studies and the way we statistically, and can I also say qualitatively appraise studies, has to be systematic. It's not, I'm comparing this with ad hoc, doing it occasionally, making up as you go along, being very selective. And lastly, not least, the way we report the findings have got to be very systematic, and we have got all sorts of guideline documents to help people report findings, and then we need another set, is how to report them for policy people for decision makers, because they're going to be different set of reporting practices to the ones we use for scientific publications. Those of us in the reviews movement and the synthesis movement believe that if we can do these, what, six bullet points, we will enhance the quality of the evidence that we have. There's a famous forest plot. I'm not going to go through, we've covered it already today, and if you don't know what one is, come see me afterwards. But the point about it is, do let's remember, it is this cumulative estimate of effect that is very powerful because it takes together, in this case, 59 separate randomised studies and gives us an overall effect that's both positive evidence and negative. The important point is, when we do the systematic 
meta-analysis, we get a strong overall study. And for qualitative systematic reviews, if anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, we're talking about synthesizing work from ethnographic studies, from in-depth interviews, focus groups, observational studies, documentary analysis, and case studies. This is a very important part of our evidence gathering. What we're doing with qualitative synthesis is not looking for statistical generalizations. We're not looking at all for internal and external validity, well, perhaps external validity, but in a different way. We're looking for the common themes, the common principles, the common concepts that come through a body of qualitative evidence. And we do this according to quite agreed standards. It's not done in an ad hoc manner. We're giving a lot of attention to contextual detail. That's the great quality of qualitative research. It gets us down to the context specificity of an area, a people, a community, or what have you. We often include in qualitative analysis, analysis of stakeholders' views. We do an awful lot of stakeholder consultation, and we very rarely collate it in a way and find out what we learn from it, and we have no institutional memory of it. That's another way in which we can use qualitative evidence. But we do not seek statistical generalizations. We seek, we are seeking commonality of themes, principles, and concepts. So another way we can be much more relevant and meaningful with uh, policy making are these things called rapid evidence assessments. Still very controversial, not supported by a lot of people in the research community, but some of us have been forced into using them just to get people to engage with evidence. They are a scaled down version of a systematic review. I'll show you how in a minute. They're timed to meet the needs of decision makers, usually a three, 13 week to three month period. We do it by looking at our search, uh, we do our searching very strategically. We don't look at everything. We identify what is going to be the most likely positive yield within the time we have available. And we have all sorts of ways of training people how to do that. We still critically appraise, we separate the wheat from the chaff, but not with the degree of detail that we would in a systematic review. And we provide very clear summary findings. People say to me, well, how scaled down do we do it? How scaled down are they? Well, in this way, the searching isn't as comprehensive. I mentioned this this morning. Fewer databases. We critically appraise, but not as rigorously. We very rarely use double screening. When you do a systematic review, you double screen at text uh, when you're reading full text. You wouldn't do that at a rapid evidence assessment. Transparency is very similar. A lot less detailed in the way we extract data, the quantity and the way we do it, a lot less detail in the amount of statistical reporting, but we do quite a lot of narrative, if not more narrative analysis. The findings are a lot less detailed. We are often driven by the findings that, are the, that have a priority within the decision-making context where they've got to be made. And there's very clear reporting structure of a one-pager for your decision-maker, three-pager, for executive summary and a longest document of 25 pages is very helpful for making evidence accessible and relevant. This is really going over this morning's again. So we now have evidence gap maps and what we're finding is certainly in the international development community is people are commissioning these first and we want them to. Get yourself a gap map, get yourself a scoping study is what we say and then we'll map it. And this gives us a map of the existing evidence on any topic. And I mentioned here maternal health, we've done one on, HIV, AIDS, agriculture, extreme poverty. We've got uh, 13 and 14, 13 down and four in the bag at the moment being done. And at the moment, they're structural intervention effectiveness, but they don't have to be. You can do a gap map of the qualitative evidence. You can do a gap map of the case, of the case study evidence, of the cost effectiveness evidence. And with the effectiveness studies, we map all the interventions that have been attempted globally to, for instance, respond to HIV AIDS. And we look at all the outcomes we're trying to achieve on the horizontal axis, and we simply match. 
are, where do we have evidence where interventions have evidence of effectiveness? And it was absolutely shattering when we did our first few gap maps because we discovered in many areas we simply don't have evidence. We have big gaps. That's why we, we used to call them evidence maps. They're now called evidence gap maps. So they tell us where we've got evidence and where we haven't. They're, we tell you about the quality of them because we're able to do that because we're taking them from a database that has already uh, uh, appraised their quality. And we link it. These are the ones we do at 3IE. We link them to user-friendly summaries. One page. A one-pager. And they are so valuable to people who use evidence to find out on one page of A4 what the evidence tells us and what it doesn't. Here is a gap map. The big bubbles, the circles mean where we've got evidence, and the bigger the bubble, the more the evidence. So on this issue here, we've got looking at the relationship between employment assistance programs and employment. Oh, sorry, no, assets, this is, that would be employment. Well, take this one. Well, I've got to do this one because it's highlighted. If you click on that grey uh, button there, it tells us we have got four impact evaluations that are looking at the relationship between um, employment assistance and assets and land use. If you were to click on that, that's a bigger button. We've got more evaluations. The reds are systematic reviews. So if you click on the reds, and the blues are protocols, protocol stages. So just that little corner of a map there tells us that there are some areas we're very evidence rich. But look at these areas. The relationship between in-kind social uh, support and living standards, health and education. This is a massive program we have in international development, which is supposed to be improving health and education and living standards. We don't have any evidence. We have an evidence gap. A bit more detail. This is the extreme poverty one. Look at the evidence gaps we have here. Okay, I'm going to just show you the gap. You can see we've got plenty. Before I do that, we do have plenty of evidence. All the bubbles. But our colleagues, and by the way, this identification was done by our policy colleagues at USAID. We did it together. We went through this and they said, boy, we really, we really need that. We cannot be put, investing vast sums of money in this area, which is devoid of evidence. This one, and these are all the ones that USAID have programs in. And DFID would have something very similar. And the really, really, really important ones are the red ones. Because this is where they expend vast sums of money in international development. And we don't appear to have any adequate evidence. So we're not going to be influential if we don't have the evidence. So I'll quit now just to say there are some sources of evidence. These slides are available, by the way. These are sources of completed systematic reviews and then not just in health. So Tara and I are very familiar with Cochrane, which is health, the National Institute of Clinical Guidelines for Britain. But these are, if you look at the first two, our impact, our impact evaluation database, our systematic reviews database, is solely based in low and middle income countries, which, of which South Africa is one. If you want evidence about education, this is a very nice education database. Campbell has education systematic reviews. There's a very nice new database on environmental evidence from the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence. There is a prospective register of systematic reviews at the University of York called, called Prospero. And there are two very helpful sources on the social impacts of uh, interventions. So we're not starting evidence blind. And I don't just want us to have this. I want every policymaker to have this slide on their PC. Because if they do a bit of double clicking on the URLs, they will have access to the evidence and that will make it much more accessible. I'm going to finish there. Thank you. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.